Thanks for joining us online. Thanks for joining us in person. Let's stand and see if I get through a song. <laughs> through you, I can do anything. I can do all things. Because it's you who gives me strength. Nothing is impossible to you. My eyes are open. Strongholds are broken. I am living by faith. Nothing is impossible. All right. Cause I'm not gonna live by what I see. I'm not gonna live by what I feel. Deep down, I know that you're here with me. Cause I know that you can do anything. Do you? I can do anything. I can do all things. Cause it's you. Give me strength. Nothing is impossible. But through you, blind eyes are open. Strongholds are broken. I am living by faith. Nothing is impossible. I believe. I believe. I believe. I believe. I believe. can do anything I can do all things cause it's you who gives me strength nothing is impossible to you blind eyes are open strongholds are broken I am living by faith nothing is impossible I can do all things, right? So that means I can come up here and talk to you guys? Amen. Well, my name is Ethan Damon. I'll be doing your announcements today. Pastor Mike, Pastor Arlene, and Pastor Robin are all away at a conference. So I am up here. So I can do all things, as he just said. So we're going to do this. All right. If you would, please join with me in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for being here, being here with us, being here in this moment, Lord. Lord, we Send out a special prayer for Kathy, for Kevin. Lord, we pray healing for Lisa, Michelle, Rachel's dad. Lord, we pray for Deanna. Lord, we also pray for all of those families, everybody in the Ukraine, Lord. Lord, we pray for safety and a quick resolution for them, Lord. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Everybody may be seated. All right, so I would first like to welcome all the visitors here at Maranatha. Uh, we're about to enter into worship, and the big thing I want to convey to you guys is that this is a safe space to worship. You're going to see people raise their hands, swaying side to side, hands here, hands here. And the big thing, the only thing we need to remember, it's not how we worship, it is that we worship our Lord. Amen. So we would, Maranatha, please send out a big greeting to our visitors here and visitors online. Would we give them a hand? All right. Now for the bulletins, you can either get a hard copy bulletin in the back or you can get them on your phone. Somehow you can get them on your phone. Don't worry. But, or, but if you see here our featured picture for today, 
We're at Linwood Lake. That is beautiful. All right, the next thing I think we got the car show coming up. We have a video for that. Do we have a video? video. known to ride the motorcycle in the church but Nikki I'm gonna blame it all on her she had the idea of hey you think you can drive your wife's car in the church I'm like let's try we made it barely but it's pretty cool and the reason why I did this Nikki said is to advertise the car show hey you guys the car show is coming it is a big deal always has been because Maria and Carl and Wendy and Jim need you to sign up and be committed because this place gets packed with people. We need people to sign up, people for help parking, people to help sell stuff, people for setting up, taking down. It's just a big deal. So sign up so they can count on you. Be a part of it. It truly is an outreach. And like every ministry, ministry has parts of it that are a lot of fun. I hope you sign up. Car show's coming this Saturday, August 13th. So be telling people about it as well. Have a great day. Amen. That was amazing. It was literally amazing. So the next thing to go over, there's no man church, August 13th, obviously because of the car show. So get back there, sign up for that. Anybody who's going to go to man church? Next thing is baptism, August 14th, and if you've been paying attention up here, it did, they did go over that. So if that's you, never made your declaration to Christ, to the world, that you, that you love our God, um, if, you're feeling, if you've been feeling drawn to that, absolutely get back there and sign up. August 14th, you join everybody at the lake, sign up for that back at the help desk. Missions trip, very short, very cheap. Next missions trip coming up is at the state fair. The only thing it's going to cost you is a state fair ticket and four hours of your time. They're helping out the, uh, the Crossroads Chapel. Um, they have a bunch of places they need help with, whether it's greeting people, that winning personality, helping kids' activities, anything like that. So if you're, uh, it's a short little missions trip there at the state fair. Women's Night Out, August 19th. Now, if my wife, Kelsey, would come up here and talk about that. All right, just kidding. I just wanted, to, just wanted that gut drop feeling a little bit for her. Um, August 19th, Women's Night Out. Uh, great food, great conversation. Come on out to that. Wednesday nights, the, what they're going to be going through, how lies are told to us and lied to by the devil. The next thing, serving opportunities. I know they go, we go over this every Sunday. Um, kids department. They need three men, two women, two leaders. They already have the... Curriculum, I can never say that word right. All you need is go back there and show up. It's an awesome opportunity. Next one is archery. I know there's some archers out there. So anybody that's passionate about archery, you can teach little kids, right? Come back and email Pastor Tina for that. The next thing, and it is my personal favorite part, one of, one of my favorite parts about Sunday morning, is breaking stereotypes. Welcome to Breaking Stereotypes. Abraham Lincoln, let the Constitution be taught in schools, in seminaries, and in college. Let it be written in primers, in other words, elementary education books, spelling books, and in almanacs. Let it be preached from the pulpit, proclaimed in legislative halls, and enforced in courts of justice. In short, let it become the political religion of the nation. And then to add to that, James Madison, for the union of these states is a wonder, the Constitution a miracle, and their example is the hope of liberty throughout the world. William Lloyd Garrison, liberty for each, liberty for all, liberty forever. This is the great foundation of which you and I have had the privilege of enjoying. The pillars, the foundation of this country 
something to think about. Amen. All right, at that, everybody could stand, greet one another, say hello, shake some hands as we get entered here into worship. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe in you. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe in you. can do all things, cause it's you who gives me strength. Nothing is impossible to you. Blind eyes are open, strongholds are broken. I am living by faith. Nothing is impossible. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you that we can trust in you, Lord. God, I thank you that you can take this broken vessel. God, that you can use it. God, I thank you because I know where I came from, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. Because all these pieces broken and scattered in mercy gathered, mended and whole. Oh, empty peace. But not forsaken I've been set free Yes, I've been set free Amazing grace How sweet the sound That saved a wretch like me Oh, I once was lost But now can see you now. Oh, I can see the love in your eyes, laying yourself down, and raising up the broken to life. our failures and you take our weakness and you set your treasure in jars of clay so take this heart lord and i'll be your vessel the world to see your life in Sometimes it helps to just to start, right? To just go. 
and to do. And, and you know, I was going to wait to say this, but I, I really want to, as we go into these next couple songs, understand that this is just, this is just a track. This is just the initial, right? Following these words, right? It's great. I mean, it, it, it's easy, right? But as you start to, to go deeper with him, as, as you start to realize that your heart is, is maybe not exactly there, you don't have to stay here, right? So what I mean by that is, yeah, it says, oh, humbly I, I stand, right? Can we get, yeah, humbly I stand an offering. And, and if you start feeling, hey, look, I, God, I, I'm not there. I, I, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still back at this first song where I'm broken, Lord. I don't even know that you can use me. Just offering that up to him. It, it's a little more dangerous, right? Because you, you don't really know where it's going to go right here. You, you can read and it's, it's easy. But I want you, I encourage you as we go through this, I just want you to, to, to check, right? Check yourself and see where you're at and just see, you know, am I singing truth here? Am I singing where my heart is? Sometimes we need to sing where our heart isn't because that's where we want to be, right? But I just encourage you as we go into these songs. Oh, humbly I stand and I'll pray. And with open hands, Lord, I bring everything and nothing less. Oh, my best, my own. You deserve my. Nothing. 
myself to you, O oh Lord. Jesus, oh, I pray, Lord, Jesus, I pray that whatever areas of my life that I'm holding back from you, I pray that I would release them to you, Jesus, and realize that you are the perfect navigator, that you are the perfect pilot for my life. Jesus, as you can have it all, Lord. Oh, every part of my world. Oh, take this life and breathe it on. This heart that is now. That oh the joy I found surrendering my crown at the feet of the king who surrendered everything that there's peace in it and oh that comes Oh, and I'm broken and undone by your unfailing grace I can lift my voice and say you can have Because God will let you take it back if you, if you choose that he doesn't make it better. But I'll tell you right now, if you truly give him your all, if you truly are all in, you can't lose. You can't lose. It's in the fear. The devil's going to tell you, you're going to have to give up everything. You're going you're to lose it all. You're going to wind up being worse off. And he can't really save you. I mean... 
you're nothing but a loser. You're nothing but a, you've gone too far. I mean, everybody else, you know, they, they didn't go that far, but, but you did. You went too far. That's a lie. And I'll tell you right now, you give him your all, he's going to give you tenfold. And I'm not talking necessarily financially, but you can be victorious. You can be happy without that stuff. But you can't be truly happy without him. You want joy? This is it. This is it. As you, uh, you can have it all, Lord. Jesus, every part. Oh, every part of my world. Because nothing else is worth it. Jesus, take this life that we are. Just breathe on it, Lord. Oh, this heart that is now yours, Jesus. Yes, Lord. We give it to you today. We give it to you, Jesus. Jesus. Because, Lord, I give you my heart. Oh, I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake. Oh, Lord, have your way in me. Before we go on, I know I'm doing a lot of talking today, but I want to, I just don't want you to miss this opportunity. I really feel today that God's got some victory for you. Jesus. So as, I, as we keep singing through this, our, our wonderful uh, 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 singers over here are going to keep going through that, and you're going to hear me just, just, just start to go off, right? And I don't know where we're going, but follow them. If you're not comfortable, that's fine, but I encourage you right now, Lord, I give you my heart. Maybe give him what, what's, what, you, what you right now are not willing to give him, right? Put it in there. Say, Lord, I give you my job. Lord, I give you my finances. Lord, I give you, Lord, my, my wayward children. Lord, I give you my worries, my pain, my anguish, my pride. God, I live for you alone. Jesus, every breath that I take, every moment that I live here, at work, at home, on vacation, in ministry, Lord, have your way in me. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath, every breath, Lord. And I'm worried, God. I give it to you. Lord Jesus, Lord, my troubles. Jesus, to you I give it. God, there was nothing that I hold back from you today. Lord, it's you and you alone. God, my pride. Lord, my voice. Lord, the ministry. Jesus. Lord, all of my friends. God, I give to you, Jesus. There is nothing. Lord, come and use me, Lord. Have your way. Lord, I give you my heart. Oh, I give you my soul. And I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake. Oh, Lord, have you. Can I have just the voices? Everybody sing. Lord, I give you my heart. Lord, I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have it all.
Jesus, have your way. Have your way in me, O oh Lord. Have your way. Oh, we give you, Lord. We give you everything, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. God. Praise God. Ray could be seated. Love that line, which is kind of, when I sat down with Pastor Mike, he said, you know, give your, your giving story as we get prepared for offering. And I was like, I don't think you want that. And he said, this is Mike at Real Church. I said, all right. But giving your heart, when it came to giving, you know, Pastor Mike always says, you don't have to give, you get to give. And I have struggled with that my whole life. You know, many different churches growing up and, and, you know, everybody's giving with that smile on their face. And with me, it was just like, Ugh. you know, I did it because you know you're supposed to. But honestly, you know, getting married, my wife is probably, I mean, she has been huge. She's going to be getting ready to leave for Sunday morning. She's like, you get the checkbook. Oh, you know, almost forgot it. So I just wanted to say, you know, and my wife would always tell me, you know, God can always change your heart. I mean, he would do it, but it was just not what... I knew it was supposed to be. It was always a struggle. I've been married for five years and, you know, and been praying on it. And over the last few years, it does get easier. You know, it's, it's not. So I just wanted to convey that, you know, to anybody. Maybe there's other people out there that, that do that. You know, they see people. You get to give, but you struggle with that yourself. You know, I do it because I you know you're supposed to. But there is hope out there. God changes our hearts. And you can change your mindset to know that, you know, giving Continuing to give, you know, you will receive those blessings on the back end. But if we could pray as we prepare for offering. Lord, we thank you for being here. Thank you for, for all of your blessings that you continue and continue and continue to give us, Lord. We just thank you for the opportunity. We thank you that we are allowed to give back to you, Lord. We just thank you for that. And again, thank you for being here and making your presence known in this building. In your holy and precious name we pray, amen. Hey, this morning I wanna just give you a brief introduction to our special guest this morning. It's Randy Stanko. He and his wife, Mary, have been pretty committed to Maranatha for some time now. They come, they come from long history of serving God in Christian ministry. He is a credentialed minister uh, in the Assemblies of God, and he'll probably tell you what he does. But would you give a warm welcome to Randy Stanko this morning? Thank you, Randy. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I, whenever I think of good morning, I think of Bri uh, um, Robin Williams. Good morning, Maranatha. All right, are we up there? We're up there. Okay. Um, Pastor said he'll, I'll tell you what I do. 19, 19, 1977, I was studying engineering at Penn State University. And my pastor had asked me to be a captain of a bus ministry and go into the projects near Scranton, Pennsylvania and uh, bring kids in. Just take a bus in and bring in kids. Well, I don't know how to drive a bus. And uh, he goes, no, I got a bus driver. You just go in, get, you know, knock on doors, get kids to come to church. So I would do that. On Saturday mornings, I'd go into the projects, and I would um, knock on doors, shoot hoops with some of the kids, ride bicycle, try to ride a skateboard. Um, and in six months, I had 66 people on my bus, kids and their parents. During that time, every, after every time I'd visit them in their neighborhood, I'd go back to the church, and it was connected to the parsonage. You know, the pastor lived there, and, and he said, well, Randy, tell me what happened. And I would tell him, and every Saturday I would tell him what happened, how that, how that morning went. Thank you. And... Uh, he goes, at one point he said, Randy, did you ever think about studying psychology? I went, what? I'm in engineering. What's that word? He goes, well, it's, it's studying people's behavior and understanding why they do things. 
And so I said, can you learn that in a, a Christian school? Um, yeah, there's one in Springfield, Missouri. I went, all right. So I applied. I got in. Um, barely, by the way. And do you know why barely? Because while I was studying engineering, I discovered that they had a, in the student union, they had a ping pong table. And that ping pong table, once you're on the table and you win, I ain't getting off until I lose. <laughs> All right? So guess what happened to my grades after the second quarter at Penn State? Oh, they were pretty bad. They were so bad that I had to leave Penn State because the, it, 0.75 GPA. Can anyone beat that? So I came back and started back up again at Penn State, and pastor asked me to, if I'd have any interest in studying psychology, and I went to Evangel, met my wife there. I was a senior. She was a freshman. I'm going to continue that in a minute, but I want to say a few things. Real I'm so sorry. Real church is a lot like real life. It's hard. Not pretty all the, not pretty all the time. Is that my beard touching the microphone? I hope not. <clears throat> it's not pretty all the time, but it is deeply, deeply joy-filled and peaceful. So I want to show you some things. Hmm. Is that going? Yeah. Socrates says, an, unexa an unexamined life is not worth living. You know, when I started to study psychology, I was studying Bible at the same time. And I'm going, this is hard. You know, studying physics and calculus, th 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 that was eh, somewhat challenging, but, it was, you know, I got it. But psychology, philosophy, one of my first tests was um, I gave an essay. I wrote an essay. And uh, it was about love. Teacher thought it was great. I get to Evangel, take my first test at Philosophy 101, okay? Philosophy. Took the three tests in the class for the whole semester, three tests. First, the middle one, and then the end one, final. They're all equal, no extra credit, no nothing. Out of 100 points, out of 100 possible points on that first test, I get 20. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I am not going back to engineering. My dad was a mechanic. He worked on transmissions all my life. And uh, um, I'm thinking to myself, wow, um, I'm not going to do that. My dad used to tell me things like, Randy, two ways to make a living. Either your muscles or your brain. And I was lazy. I picked the brain. <laughs> the problem with that is, I think it was Princeton, a former pastor of mine, gave a sermon and talked about uh, this study that was done. I think it was Princeton. It might have been Harvard. This would have been in the uh, late 70s. The study showed that one hour of mental focus is to the body what eight hours of manual labor is. And I'm thinking, I'm already down this road. I can't quit now. This is going to be hard, isn't it, Lord? So, I go, to, I go that direction. Second Corinthians, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or, do you not realize this about yourselves? That Jesus Christ is in you. Unless, indeed, you fail to meet the test. Those tests, doesn't that bother you? The test stuff. I, uh, 
I don't like tests. I don't like the A, you know, is it A, B, C, or D? Give me an essay. I can write that. I can think about that, but not A, B, C, or D. Because sometimes, given some circumstances, the answer is A, and then if you change, it could be B. And then, well, no, C is obviously wrong, okay, but is it A or B or A or D or what is it? That's um, I got all the confusion in my mind. So, what has Satan tried to do to people? And what did he try to do to me? My dad, any, anyone here old enough to have seen the TV show All in the Family? <laughs> oh, look at that. I'm glad I'm not alone. I'm not, I'm not the oldest one in the room. So, my dad was like Archie. And I said, Dad, you're just like, we'd, we'd leave church on Sunday night and go home. We'd put on all in the family. And we'd all be sitting there in the family room watching. And Archie would do something. And I would say, Dad, you're just like that. And he goes, man, why is that funny? <laughs> I thought, my dad was like 5'7". And I thought, you're really short. Everything went over your head. I couldn't say that. So what is Satan attempting to do? He does a few things. He deceives about reality and truth. He distorts reality and truth. And he destroys God's definitions of reality and truth. And that's what he's hoping that we follow. So when I left home, what I followed was the idea that the only way I would ever get my dad to like me is to be smart enough. So I poured myself into college to become smart enough because that's what would allow my dad to like me. Let me introduce you to my wife. This is Mary. Hey, Mary, she's on the road right now going to Colorado. She'll be back in a few weeks. This is where we lived in Colorado. That's Mount Sneffels. Four years ago, we left Colorado to come here to the cities. You know Mount Sneffels? You ever see it? 14,150 feet. I climbed that seven times. We lived in a little town of, when we got there, it was 450 people. Town of Ure. Not Ure, as most people pronounce it. It's O-U-R-A-Y. It's called Ure. Indian chief of um, Ure. Um, it was his, it was his, there's seven, um, what do you call those? It's hot springs. Seven hot springs in this little town. It's a half mile wide, three quarters of a mile long, and you got 5,000 foot cliffs going up. And you would think, what an amazing place to raise kids. If they go anywhere, oh, by the way, they don't deliver mail there. You got to go to the post office. But that was only a two-block walk. <laughs> if the kids do anything, I would know. What a place to raise kids, I thought. So I went there, took my family. I also did this up there. That's, uh, do you notice the, the name on that tank? Yeah. Because it's the only motorcycle that I know is mentioned in the Bible right here. <laughs> they will wage war against the lamb and the lamb will triumph and conquer them because he is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And again, <clears throat> he will take action against them and triumph. Now triumph is mentioned in scripture 72 times. I just thought you should know. Harley <laughs> Davidson is not mentioned. <laughs> we left Colorado because in January of 2018, we get a call from my son, Stephen, on the, in the picture. His wife is Victoria, and they now have three kids. Zeke is five, and Gabriella and Serenity are three-year-old twins. We get a call from Stephen 
in January of 18, and Stephen says, I saw the doctor today, the lupus is getting worse. It's beginning to show signs of crossing the blood-brain barrier. And when that happens, psychosis is next. When it stays in the brain, psychosis is next. And the next thing that happens is that I die. Well, Mary and I decided, well, of course. I left a full-time practice in Ure, Montrose area. Of course, I'm going to be with my son in his last years, however many years that is, 10 years or 20, we don't know. But he is getting worse. It's very painful for him to, to live. And the doctor said after Zeke was born, Stephen, Victoria, do not have any more children. It will take your body beyond what your body can do. And they have twins. Great. And Stephen, when, little, when you get pinched by your little child, you go, ow, you know. Stephen has 20 minutes of pain after the pinch. You have to understand, you understand the, what it goes through for a dad to know that the best he can do, the kids don't know how they hurt his body. And he's just in it. He's a dad and he's doing wonderful. But that's why we came. And I couldn't understand. Mary worked for North Central University for a while. I worked at Teen Challenge for a while. And I didn't understand Lord, what are you doing in my life? And then he does something interesting. We left a son in Colorado. That son is with me, Jonathan. Stand up. This is Jonathan, my son Jonathan. He has a son, a wife, Janeth, and a son, Levi, and a brand new son who's going to be a year. This is an older picture, um, who is Samuel. And we will have our whole family within a three-hour drive. They're moving to La Crosse. Stephen is in Toma, and we're in um, Cambridge. What is God doing? Have to ask that question. What is he doing? Before I answer that question, it's going to take a few more moments. This is my office in Colorado. Why do I show you that? Well, I worked with, from about 89, 1989, to about 2006, 2007, with kids and their families, where kids were mostly adopted, some were foster kids, they were blow, blow, blowing out of their house. One 16-year-old burned his father's house down four times, twice to the ground to rubble, two other times they were able to rebuild what was left. Kids that were one girl when she was four threw her two-year-old brother down the stairs to kill him. Pretty intense, serious issues. And I'd go work with them with a team of two other therapists and we'd live with them for a week or two and I traveled all around the United States being called by families and lived with them for two weeks. I went to Alaska twice. I went to the Northeast, Connecticut, and Rhode Island and, and a number of times, um, Midwest a number of times. I was pretty good. I was able to help families with their kids to open up their hearts to let love get in. That was our job to open up a heart to let love in. I'm gone a lot. What does that do to my family? What was my family going through? First of all, they're going through pain. Why? Well, Mary raising kids alone with only my, my brilliant intellectual support. Honey, here in the book, you see? Just just do that. Just do that. Kids will be fine. You know? That's what the book says. You know, easy. Honey, do you want me to put that book somewhere? <laughs> Jonathan, without a dad, acts out his pain. 
Stephen, without a dad, hides his pain. You have to understand, I'm traveling the country, living with people to help their families be loving. And what is my family doing? Hurting. The problem of man, what is the problem of man? Because I have to ask, the engineering mind that I have is terrible when you apply it to, to myself, people, because, you know, that shouldn't be that way. You shouldn't be asking me that way, but you are. That means something else is going on inside somewhere that you don't know, possibly, or maybe you don't want to say, but so I'm hunting. I'm hunting about what the motive is. The problem of man is simple. Adam and Eve taught it to us. We've been dealing with this ever since Adam and Eve. Satan comes to Eve. Now, this is a scene I'd like you to kind of see. Let's say, let's say this is Eve and this is Adam, okay? Put yourself, guys, put yourself on the stool in your mind. Women, you are at the, the uh, podium. podium. Um, I, I'm old enough that words no longer come to me so easy. <laughs> Here's Satan. Hey, Eve, I got to talk to you. I got to tell you about something. You know what the Lord said about eating this fruit? Boy, does it taste good. And doggone, it will give you knowledge. What happened to Adam? What did I do to Adam? What did Satan do to Adam? Think about that. Goes right by and talks to Eve. Men have been fighting to be noticed ever since. <laughs> Sometimes they give up and they just go ahead and take the back seat. And sometimes they want to be noticed, and the only way they know how to be noticed is to be a jerk. But we've been fighting that ever since. Being ignored. If you're a firstborn, you don't know this feeling. You, your siblings under you know that they look up to you. You're the leader. You've already been down this road. You can teach me. So here is Adam. He's first. By the way, people say all the time, Christians say all the time, you know, God made everything good. He created this, it was good. He created this, it was good. He created this, it was good. He created Adam, it was good. <clears throat> I have a question. And you don't put an engineering psychology guy in scripture because I ask why a lot. It's not good for man to be alone? Wait, wait, wait. Lord, you just got done saying you created and everything's good. Now you're saying it's not good for man to be alone. And by, by the way, if, why, why was Adam alone since you and he walked in the cool of the day, and if you're a hunter, um, you know that the cool of the day is around 4 a.m., 5 a.m. in the morning, not in the afternoon when the sun goes down. It's in the morning when the sun's been gone for quite a while. That's the cool of the day. So in the beginning of the day, he and Adam are walking around Talking, visiting. Sometimes I can imagine they're on the side of the bank of the Euphrates River, Tigris River, and they're just sitting there, and Adam picks up a rock and plunks it in the river, and, uh, and, and he plunks in, and he throws another rock and it plunks in, and he plunks this one and goes that way, and sees a rock skip and goes, how did that bounce? God says, this is my fantasy, God says, you saw that bounce? I did. I saw a bounce. Did you see? I did see a bounce. Maybe, maybe another one will bounce. Kerplunk. Kerplunk. Oh, God, gone it. Whoa, it bounced three times. Hmm. I think God is so thrilled to watch 
Adam discover something. Just like we have children and they discover something. We feel that, what God felt with Adam. And he says, Adam shouldn't be alone. That's a fascinating idea to me. They're fellowshipping every day. When a child is born, they have this much need. And parents, we are not perfect. And at some point, we fail to meet the need, and we meet less than what the need actually is. It's less. That gap, now you might say, less? What do you mean? I feed them all the time. I clothe them all the time. They're not, they're not cold, right? Right? They're not cold. Yes, they're fed. But when they start crying, and it took you two minutes to heat up the, the formula, that's two minutes of hunger pain to an infant, a newborn. Let's add a few months. I want crawling across the floor. I want the cookie. No, the cookie's after dinner. Dinner comes first, then the cookie. Ah, I want the... And so there is, in the child's mind, the, excuse me, the idea that there's this much pain that he's dealing with not getting what he wants, and parents meet the needs less. We're imperfect. It's not possible for any human to meet the need of the child. And I even worked with people in Southern California, very, very wealthy people whose nanny was told, I don't want my baby to feel the mess in the diaper. So you wait there until the mess is being made and you clean it up as it's being made because I don't want my child to feel the discomfort of the mess. Wow. Wow. So when people don't let us feel things that are negative, we don't grow any emotional muscles to handle negative things. How do you grow a muscle in your body? You lift a number of times until you break down the muscle, and then you do what? You give it a rest of 24 hours, and when it's resting, it's coming back, and it comes back a tad stronger than when you started to lift. And then you do it again, and you give it rest, and it comes back a tad stronger. Emotional muscles actually develop the exact same way and our country, our society, our state is working very hard at taking away discomfort from people. That's a problem. In 1994, I was, uh, excuse me, 1992, I was interviewed with a colleague of mine by a Salt Lake City NBC affiliate that came to our center working with kids and they asked me a question, it was the wrong question to ask. They asked, where do you think the society will be in 50 years? If nothing changes, society will need to have a lot of jails and prisons. They didn't like that comment. When we are growing, we are needing to find a way to handle that gap between what I need and what I get. How do we handle that gap? One kid misbehaves, the other kid becomes the, the good boy or girl. And, and maybe another kid talks and another kid um, does music. Or, or talk this way when dad's in a room, but you talk the other way when mom's in the room. You talk different when uncle or grandfather's in the room or grandmother, and you just are different, and you begin to learn strategies of handling 
a way to minimize the pain in that pain gap. So by the time I'm older, I have what psychology calls a personality, and even secular psychology calls it the false self. By definition, the false self is that strategy that I have authored to handle my life and the challenges of my life. By definition, I think the Bible calls that the fleshly nature. They didn't have psychology when, back when scripture was being written. Well, they had psychology in terms of what it was, but not a formal name for it. Fleshly nature is what? What did Adam and Eve do? They handled their sin. They covered themselves up and they hid. Now, sometimes I wonder if Adam and Eve were just a brick short. Really, they're hiding from their creator. Really? How do you do that? How do you hide? What hole do you go in that he doesn't know? What bush do you hide behind? And said in modern time, what can I fool him with about me? What can I, I can, how about this one? When I was at Evangel, I walk into my room with a bunch of guys in there, walk into my room, and uh, one time they're all talking, and uh, I'm here with what they're talking about. Some guy, now young people don't know this, but there were, there were LPs, records, that were in a jacket, paper jacket, okay? And that jacket had an opening only on one side, right? These guys, someone, and they were talking about this, some person, put shaving cream in the jacket, put it under a door, stepped on it, sprayed the room with shaving cream. I walk in and I hear this and I'm saying, what are we, in kindergarten? Well, that kind of put a damper on things, and guess what? They all leave, and okay. One guy comes back and says, Randy, one of the guys that were just here was Royce, and Royce said he's getting you tonight. Well, I had a little bit of psychology, and I know that if I don't let him know that he got me, he'll keep doing it. So I figured out a scheme. I think it was brilliant. Because it worked. I, in the middle of the night, put double stick tape along the outside of my door. And we, two rooms shared a bathroom. So I can go out through the bathroom, out to the hallway, do this. And I put newspaper on it. I covered it with shaving cream. And I go back in my room. And I hear people in the morning going by going, oh, Randy, look at that. Someone got you. Oh, I opened the door and I pretended like, hey, what is this? What's going on? So I go run around and I, I act like I'm having a fit over my door having shaving cream. Well, newspaper. I really didn't want to get the carpet stained, so I also put newspaper on the carpet in case anything fell down. And I thought that was the giveaway. He had to know that I planned this, but he didn't. And I heard him go by the room, um, and he goes, whoa, Randy, that's pretty cool. You got, someone got you. I let that go for years until I began to feel people hide from God we kind of punish ourselves so that God doesn't have to, you know, punish as hard as he might want to. And we hide our motives. We don't let him see our true self, which is God's design. God made you. And when he made you, he didn't say, oops. He would never said, oops. Bible says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. What does that mean? I was watching my mom bake a cake. And I'm thinking to myself, why don't you just throw it all in? No. Fearfully and wonderfully, if you're a cook or a baker, fearfully and wonderfully made, 
You are designing. You are strategic in how much sugar, how much basil, how much whatever the ingredients are. And even the time that you, and the order in which you put the um, elements together. We were made fearfully and wonderfully. Our design, God says, is good. We start out, our true identity is what God designed and took so much strategic care in making. What are you doing? Oh. Fearfully and wonderfully made. And our problem basically is, I'm, Lord, you're better than me, I know. I know you are, but you know what? If I don't like me on the inside, how in the world are you going to like me? You've got to discipline me. You've got to make me in pain. You've got to do things because that's what I would do. And so we pretend with God who we really are. And I didn't hear that for years growing up. I thought when you are introduced to someone or whatever and you, you tell them what you do. Graduate school, group therapy class, 12 of us in the class, teacher gets us in a circle and says, all right, answer this question. Who are you? And it kind of struck me odd. That's a weird question to ask. Who am I? So everyone answers in the group. Everyone says the same thing. We are, I do this, and I do this, and I do this, and I'm this, I do this, and I do this. And teacher says at the end, do you really like BSing each other like that? What? I'm, I'm sorry. I probably shouldn't have said that. Um, I just didn't understand. And what is that? What is he after? He says, who you are is not what you do. Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. When Moses asks, who should I tell them sent me? God says, I am. The starting point of identity is me. The starting point of my life is me, and I want you to know, I know that there's a lot in Christianity today that suggests that it doesn't, it's not about you. Really, then why would I want eternal life? Why would I want to know Jesus if I'm not about me? Why would my mixed up son or my mixed up daughter, if, if her life is not about her, why would she want, why would my son want Jesus? It is about us. Jesus died for me. He died, gave his life for me. Not the false self me. And sometimes we wonder about that. We wonder about why doesn't God hear me? Why doesn't he hear me? Well, I am going over and I apologize. My identity starts with me. But how do I get to my true identity? I can't unless I first go through my false identity. I can't get to the true me unless I'm willing. So here is Romans. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God because it's through Jesus Christ, our Lord, not what I present. It's the me that I don't like. It's the me that I'm ugly. I, I know I'm ugly. Uh, I was dr going around the country, staying away from my family. That's in their minds they thought that. I didn't think that. I was thinking I'm making a living. I'm trying to, I'm doing the Lord's work. Um, that's what I thought. At the most shallow level, that's the truth. The deeper level, I was not 
loving my family. It's that deep level that God wants us to feel the pain. Why? Why does he want us to feel that pain? Number one, it's true. I'm going to skip. <clears throat> it's true that I hurt, that I'm not the true Randy that God intended. I heard about that. I'm ashamed of that. I don't like that in me. So what do I do? Well, typical thing is I hide it. Wear a mask. Whatever. I hide it. If I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, not me, I am not the author of my life. I'm the author of my false life, but I'm not the author of my true life. My true life is hidden because it's sinful. And believe in your heart Talk louder. <laughs> oh, it's on now? Hello, test. Oh, it's back on. All right. I know that's, that's a signal I'm over time. <laughs> For with the heart one believes and is justified, not the mind, not my thoughts, not what I think is true, but what is actually true. And I never have to be ashamed a lot of us think that there's a lake of sin and I'm on one side of the lake, I see Jesus on the other side of the lake and I've got to make my way through that lake to get to Jesus. That lake of sin, I don't, and so we stay on this side as we think Jesus is over there and the truth is Jesus is right here beside me and he says to me, Randy, I actually want to go with you as we walk through the lake of sin in your life. Real relationship isn't the pretend of good. It's the acceptance of what's real. I so like the motto of Maranatha, real church. I so like that. So what happens when I am with myself and I see my ugly? What do I do? There's two things I need to do. The first thing I need to do is to go to Jesus. And when I go to him, I go to him like that. You know this picture? This photo, this uh, painting? If you look at it, it's very wonderful because that's me. That's me with the hammer. That's me with the, uh, the nail. And you see the blood in the rock, the red blood in the rock, the holes in his hands. I did that. I did that how? Because when God was making me and had me in his mind, he, I was wonderful in his mind. And I made me ugly by staying away from him and hiding myself. Second step after this. Think... One of the kids I worked with, 17-year-old boy, would key church, um, cars in the parking lot of his church. Go down the car and just key it all the way down. Parents had enough. Had brought their son to us. And uh, he's violent. So we had to restrain him. So there's three of us. And he's restrained. And um, we're trying to get him to talk the truth. Say the truth. What is the truth? I want my dad. No, it, you, don't want your, you don't want your dad. Um, that's not true. You, you are structuring your life to run away, so that's not true. Yeah, what is the truth? Finally, after a few hours of this game, um, he finally gets and he calls out, I just want my dad. I want my dad. He's screaming. And dad was watching through a one-way, a two-way mirror, and he sees that. Dad, uh, he was an engineer, and his wife was, mother was um, um, a librarian. Very intellectual people. 
he's screaming for dad. No, you're, you don't want him. That's a lie. That's a lie. No, I want him. He's trying tears coming out of his eyes. Dad breaks into the room and pulls us away from him and grabs his son for the first time since his son was a baby. What happens when we go to the Lord broken? He holds us. He grabs us. He holds us close. Let's our ear hear the beat of his heart. And he wipes our tears. If the uh, music worship team can come back up and we're going to do, the, do that last song, but before we do that, I want to give you an opportunity. Um, in the prayer team, there's a prayer team here, and I'd like you all, the prayer team, to come up, because I'd like to offer a prayer for you. If you'd like me to pray, my son's going to come as well and offer to pray for you. If you have something to pray for, the music will be playing. Oh, and there's, I think there's a, uh, when we're all done, the chairs have to be stacked seven high, and so there's a little bit of mechanics that have to go on. So there's a prayer team. And if the Lord tells you something today about your heart, that you've been hiding it from him, he wants you to simply tell him. And if the only thing you could tell him is, I've been hiding from you, and I'm scared. I'm scared to come back. I, I, now, I know that I'm with you on the outside. I play the Christian game. I play the Christian culture. I do that, and I do that really well, Lord, but I know that my heart is far from you. When my son went to Teen Challenge, when he came back, when he came back, I knew in my mind, I knew that if he made a change in his heart, he would have had to come to grips that I have failed him in some way and finally he told me he was back within our home for three months and he said this he goes dad do you remember when I was little you'd want me to think about what I did wrong and you'd have me sit let cross legged at the wall and you'd put a little dot on the wall with a pencil I said yeah and I wanted you to think he goes you know, I, Dad, I was a visual learner. I'm a visual learner. I said, okay. He said, you know what I was thinking about? I was hoping he was going to say what you did wrong. No, he was thinking about the dot. Whether it was totally round or just a dot or whether I color it into lines or outside or... or that's what he's thinking. And he looked at me. Dads, hear this. He looked at me and he said, you missed my heart. God wants our heart. He wants our heart. Let's stand. Only... I'm only eight minutes over. If you'd like prayer, come on up. I'll be very happy to pray with you. My son is here to pray. The prayer team is here. If you want to just get to a place where you take off just a little bit of a mask to the Lord, please do something.